In this video tutorial, we will be looking at solubility equilibrium, also known as KSP. Before we move ahead, let's briefly review over the process of dissolving at the molecular level. So in this animation over here, we have an example of a ionic compound. Let's pretend it's table salt, where you have a repeating pattern of a negative and positive, negative and positive. Right? So this would be a chlorine anion, negative ion, and this would be a sodium cation, positive ion. Now, if you recall, water is a polar molecule where one pole or one end of the water molecule is partially negatively charged and the other pole or the other end of the water molecule is partially positively charged. Uh, this is due to the unequal sharing of electrons within the chemical bonds and so the oxygen atom tends to hold on to electrons when rather the electrons spend more time around the oxygen atom on this side giving it a negative charge or partially negative charge anyway and this end has a deficit of electrons. The electrons do not spend as much time on this end making this end slightly positively charged. And so when we dissolve salt in water this is what happens. The water molecules come in and pull the ionic compound apart. They dissociate it ion by ion. If we take a closer look over here, you'll notice it's the partially positive end of the hydrogen grabs onto the chlorine anion, which is negative, and so opposite charges, partial positive end of the dipole, attracts the negative cation or anion rather, and pulls it apart. Similarly, when the oxygen end of the water molecule comes by, it is attracted towards the positive cation and it pulls it apart. So notice how the negative partial charge on the oxygen dipole is attracted to the positive cation of the sodium ion, if it was salt for instance. Now please keep in mind that if a, an ionic compound is going to be soluble, the ion-ion attraction, so the attraction between the ions, the uh, attraction that holds this ionic compound together, must be weaker than the dipole-ion attraction. All right? So in order for water to pull this and dissociate this thing apart, the ion dipole attraction must be stronger than the ion-ion attraction that holds it together. If the ion-ion attraction is stronger than the attraction between the ion and the dipole, then we would say that the compound is insoluble. It does not dissolve. At least it doesn't dissolve very well anyway, because the water molecule can't pull it apart. So if you recall, solubility is the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve in a given quantity of solution at a certain temperature. It is important to remember that the term insoluble doesn't mean that the solid can't dissolve at all, it just means that very little of it can actually dissolve, less than 0.1 grams of solid dissolving in 100 mils of solution. All right? So please keep that in mind, insoluble doesn't mean that it doesn't dissolve, it just means that the amount that does dissolve is typically considered to be negligible. On the other hand, soluble means more than 1 gram of solid dissolving in 100 mils of solution, whereas anything in between the 0.1 grams and the 1 gram is considered to be slightly soluble. Now, when dealing with insoluble compounds, for example, the silver chloride over here, there exists a dynamic equilibrium between the dissolved component, so the silver and the chlorine, which is dissolved, and the undissolved component, the silver chloride, which is a solid. Meaning that some of the silver chloride will break up into the aqueous uh, silver and chlorine ions, while some of the aqueous silver and chlorine ions will recombine again back into silver or solid silver chloride. As such, you can set up an equilibrium expression to describe this relationship, this equilibrium. But instead of using products over reactants, we're going to call it dissolved over undissolved. Please keep in mind that the process of dissolution, the process of dissolving, is not a chemical reaction. It's not a chemical change. Dissolving is a physical change. You're not making any new substances with new properties. All you're doing is separating the molecules a little bit further away from each other, um, and that's pretty much it. You're not making any new compounds. So please keep in mind, it's not a chemical reaction. Dissolving is a physical change. So as such, we can't call it products over reactants. We need to call it dissolved over the undissolved component. Now remember, when we set up this equilibrium expression, because silver chloride is a solid, we don't factor it in. All right? The concentration of pure solids and liquids are constant and should not be included in the equilibrium expression. Thus, we can simplify our equilibrium expression by getting rid of the denominator and leaving it as this. So this is known as the solubility product constant, Ksp. All right. So Ksp, Keq, they're the same equation, but the, by saying Ksp, we're just being a little more specific. We're referring to not an equilibrium, a chemical equilibrium, but rather a uh, solubility equilibrium instead. When we have a large Keq value, that indicates that the numerator 
is large. In that case, the concentration of products is high. Well, similarly, a large KSP value tells us that the numerator is very large as well. And what is in the numerator? The dissolved component. So that tells us that this compound dissolves very well. On the other hand, if you have a very low KSP value, that tells me that the denominator is very large. And what's in the denominator? The undissolved component. So if I have a lot more undissolved, that tells me that the substance is likely to be insoluble. So there's no need for you to have a solubility chart or to memorize the solubility rules anymore. All we have to do is just give you your KSP values and that will tell you whether a substance is soluble or insoluble. Large KSP value, soluble. Low KSP value, insoluble. Now, as with other equilibrium constants, KSP is also temperature dependent. Unless otherwise stated, most KSP values are going to be assumed to be in an aqueous solution at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, molar solubility is another way for us to express how well a substance will dissolve. It describes how many mole of solute can dissolve in a set volume of solution, typically measured in liters. Please keep in mind that solution is equal to the amount of solute and solvent combined together. When dealing with molar solubility questions, a common mistake students will make is to set up an ice chart. That isn't necessary. Molar solubility doesn't talk about how much can dissolve initially, it describes how much can be dissolved at the end, at equilibrium. So here the question states the molar solubility of barium hydroxide is 0.108 moles per liter, meaning at equilibrium, 0.108 moles of barium hydroxide can dissolve in one liter of solution. So now it's asking what is its KSP value? So we write out our KSP expression. KSP is equal to the products, or in this case, what is dissolved, divided by what is undissolved. Uh, of course, because this is a solid, we don't have to factor it in. Just worry about the barium and the hydroxide over here. Now, another common mistake I typically see students make is to write out the dissolution or dissolving equation as barium hydroxide produces a barium ion and then OH2. No, 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 no. What happens is barium hydroxide releases two hydroxides, not an OH2 that's combined together. All right, so please be careful of that. We do not go this route. We have to go this way over here. Barium hydroxide will break up into two hydroxides, not an OH2. That, of course, becomes important because now we can see that there is a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio. That way, if I drop off or have a break apart 0.108 moles of barium hydroxide, I also release 0.108 moles per liter of barium ions, but then double that amount because you release two hydroxides. And don't forget to take the 2 coefficient and make it into an exponent. And there you have your KSP expression. So once again, very important that you remember barium hydroxide will break up into two hydroxide ions and do not write it as OH2. Otherwise, you'll be missing out on this number here and double this amount as well. From there, it's just a matter of substituting in your values and solving for KSP. With a KSP value of 0 0.005, that tells me that the denominator is larger. And so there's more undissolved barium hydroxide than there is dissolved barium hydroxide, telling me that barium hydroxide has a low solubility. Now, what if we go in the opposite direction, where I give you the KSB value and I ask for its molar solubility instead? So again, if I'm asking for molar solubility, no need for an ice chart, just equilibrium, because molar solubility, by definition, refers to how much you can dissolve when all is said and done. Not initially. Not the change, but how much can you dissolve when all is said and done at equilibrium? You'll notice that I've left the solid empty because solid concentrations do not change, so I don't have to worry about them. But I do need to know what are these values over here. I decide to say let X represent the iron concentration, and then that means the hydroxide concentration must be 3X because this is a 1 to 1 to 3 ratio when you break iron 3 hydroxide apart. Please keep in mind that you do not have to do it this way. I could easily say let uh, this represent x, but then this would have to be one-third x because it's one-third as much. I don't recommend this method because uh, personally I don't like fractions and uh, I find that most students tend to make a lot more mistakes when it involves fractions. So keep it simple. Whoever has a coefficient of 1, let that one represent x and this one just becomes three times as much 3x. Makes your calculations a lot easier. So we now substitute our values in. x for the iron concentration, 
3x for the hydroxide concentration. Don't forget the coefficient of a 3 gives it a cubed. And then your KSP value gets plugged in over here. From there we solve for x and we get a value of 9.9 .9 times 10 to the power of negative 11 moles per liter and that represents the concentration of iron 3 plus. Now since the iron 3 plus concentration and the amount of iron 3 hydroxide that dissolves is a 1 to 1 ratio then the value for iron 3 hydroxide is also 9.9 .9, 10 to the power of negative 11 moles of iron 3 hydroxide can dissolve if you had a 1 liter solution. All right, let's try a problem where we do need an ice chart. So in this situation over here, we have 0 0.5 moles of calcium bromide dumped into a one liter uh, solution of water. Now, uh, some students ask, what happens if you dump the powder into the water? Won't the volume of the water rise? Yes, it will, but keep in mind that rise in water is typically going to be negligible. When you pour in a little bit of sugar into a cup of water, do you notice the volume of the water rising significantly? Typically not. So uh, for the problems that we will encounter in this course, you may assume negligible volume increase unless otherwise specified in the question itself. Now the difference between this question and the previous ones, the reason why this one requires an ice chart while this one does not require an ice chart, is because this one refers to molar solubility. What is the molar solubility? And by definition, molar solubility refers to what happens at equilibrium when the uh, dissolution process is over. Whereas with this question, it's giving you initial values. It's saying 0.5 moles of calcium bromide is dumped into a 1 liter solution. It's not telling you what's happened at equilibrium. It's telling you what is initially occurring. Then it says its degree of dissociation is 12%, meaning only 12% of the 0.5 mole sample will break up. So therefore, you have some information about your change. So this all tells me that I'm going to need an ice chart to solve this problem. So just like all the other equilibrium uh, questions we've done before, just start filling in the chart. Uh, since the calcium bromide is going to dissolve, it's going to be a minus x value. This will be a plus x. But this will be a plus 2x because you're going to have twice as many bromine ions being released. All right? And then at equilibrium, you'll have a 0 0.5 minus x, an x, and a 2x value. Because the question says 12% will break up, well, we do 12% of 0 0.5 equals to 0 0.06, then that means I know that x is equal to 0 0.06. And I can go ahead and change my x values into 0 0.06, 0 0.06, and 2 times 0 0.06. That will leave us with equilibrium values of 0 0.44, 0 0.06, 0 0.12, and we can substitute these values in to our equilibrium expression. Notice how the 0.44 is ignored because it's a solid. And of course, don't forget the coefficient of a 2 must be factored in as an exponent. From there, just solve, and we get a KSB value of 8.64, 10 to the power of negative 4, super small number, and that indicates to us the denominator is bigger, which is the undissolved component, and that tells us the calcium bromide doesn't dissolve very well. Now part B of the question asks what mass of calcium bromide is left undissolved. We know that we had 0.5 moles originally and in the end we only have 0.44 left. So 0.44 moles of calcium bromide did not dissolve. Mass of calcium bromide is mole times the molar mass which we can get from the periodic table and there you have it 88 grams of calcium bromide remain undissolved. 